Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining our uh, uh, webinar this morning on the topic of invisible injuries and long-term consequences of electric shock. Uh, I have John Knoll here today, our guest speaker with us. And uh, John is an electric shock survivor and is based out in Alberta, Canada. So the primary reason for this topic of discussion today is when you look at electrical safety, there's a lot more emphasis that's been placed on electrical arc flash incidents and arc blasts and such, and very minimal uh, focus is put on electric shocks. But if you look in the real time examples or real statistics or the data, it all points out to most people get electric shocks in most of their workplace um, incidents compared to electric uh, arc flash or arc blasts and such. So, uh, but the problem is electric shock gets unnoticed because the severity is not there at that given point in time, whenever that happens. And more so, these effects go on long-term, not just at that juncture. So being very little as far as uh, the severity is concerned at that given point in time, most people don't pay attention to this or they get unreported. So John is here to talk about it because John has received like hundreds of shocks throughout his career. And then he has been going through the sufferings of this electric shock on a long-term basis, like five years, seven years after the fact. And then he's here uh, with us today and he has accepted to talk to our audience to specifically focus on the impact of electric shocks, not just on the day you receive the shock, but more so on its effects on the long-term basis and what some of those are as a living survivor and how to mitigate those electric shocks and what needs to be done to bring more awareness to the people who work in this trade-off uh, electricians and uh, journeymen. So with that, I'm gonna ask uh, John to give a quick introduction about what he does and uh, his background experience so go ahead, John, it's all yours. Thanks, Benu, thanks for having me today. Um, I started off in the trade at 18. Um, it was 2005, December or January, 2006. And it was right at the height of the boom. Um, you know, my first job was an apartment building. It was being trimmed out. And um, very early on, we started getting shocked. You know, um, we were installing plugs and uh, switches while guys were installing breakers. We'd be installing light switches and somebody would walk in the room sometimes just for fun. That's kind of like a joke and turn a light switch on. And that attitude is kind of something that is in our trade, not everywhere, not every company, you know, more residential, a little bit commercial, um, not as much industrial, but it's an issue. Um, guys don't understand that that little zap you get can have severe consequences later on in your life. So when did you, uh, when did you first get your electric shock, John? I mean, uh, give us a few examples of when did you started to get electric shocks? Because uh, I think we both connected before and we talked about the, the, while you were 18 years old during your first apprenticeship or such, correct? Is it when you received your first shock, if I'm not wrong? Yeah, as, as I was saying, it was a couple of weeks in, um, trimming out the apartment buildings. And yeah, you started to receive low voltage, 120 volt shocks. Um, after a while, I was deemed as a competent person and I was asked to go work in the parkades and um, wasn't allowed to turn off the panels. How could you shut off the panels on the parkades? So we were pulling wires, uh, cutting in panels live. And then early on, I got a residential work van around nine months into the trade. And I was off wiring homes. And the safety was not instilled in us because we were cutting in live panels in homes so we could listen to radios. Um, we had ladder and construction safety, but we were never taught electrical safety. And this carried on throughout my career. You know, I did a small stint in the union as a fourth year, and that was the first time we've even heard of arc flash. And that was about 2009 that I was, you know, working for the union for a few months. But as those arc flash presentations were being shown to us, I kept on asking about shock and the answer was nothing. Nobody knew. Nobody just said that's part of your job. Um, I don't think everybody knew the severity of what was happening um, in some places around our province. And it's not just me. I have many guys that have told me stories that they would be cutting in plugs and the person teaching them, their journeyman, would turn the power on to try and catch them, not tick testing. As silly as that sounds, because they wanted to scare them 
So they didn't experience a higher voltage shock, not ever realizing that the low voltage shocks are just as dangerous as the higher voltage shocks. Absolutely. The symptoms that you go through are so complex and it's just a patholog pathological set of symptoms that begins developing in the injured. So, I mean, you identified two things, right? One is you, don't, you didn't get a proper electrical safety training other than getting a ladder safety training for the workplace, more like a general safety, correct? That's what you received. Yeah. Nothing, nothing electrical safety or flash and such, correct? So- No, uh, I, I have zero electrical safety training. Uh, absolutely none. So is that because is that because the employer was not enforcing that within the crew, or is it just because that's not a practice then? Um, I number one, the employers that I worked for never had proper apprenticeship ratios. Okay. Those apartment buildings were ran by kids my age. They there was a first year running those crews. And basically managing the apartment, you would have a journeyman electrician just come by and check up the odd time. And the same thing with me when I went to parkades. I'd be pulling the parkades. I would have people, I was three months in the trade and there'd be somebody else I was teaching in the parkade and I was working alone. Uh, mm -hmm. We were working alone with very little supervision. Um, electrical safety didn't exist, but we weren't taught electrical safety because we weren't even working with journeyman electricians. Majority of my career, I have never worked with a journeyman electrician through my apprenticeship. Hmm. That's interesting. So I think, do, do you think it has to also contribute to the fact that uh, the work is being done on a contracting firm or a commercial entities because you have like multiple crews working on 15 things, they're all in rush mode to get the work done. Do you think anything of those would contribute to that too? Or uh, uh, Apprentices are cheaper. Okay. You know, um, why, why throw a journeyman in to run that, uh, that job when an apprentice is half the wage? You know, more, less than half the wage because a good journeyman is probably going to be making more than J-man rates. So um, that's the reason. Um, oh. Nobody was watching. There, there is absolutely zero health and safety in Alberta when it comes to job site inspections. I've never seen an OHNS inspector or a safety person walk on a job site in over my decade of being in the trade. Um, I've never even, when I ran a business, I never even had somebody from the apprenticeship board reach out to me to make sure that I was doing things properly. Um, our government doesn't do anything um, about the health and safety of our electrical workers. Um, so so is, is it uh, safe to assume that enforcement authorities come into picture only after the fact, once the event occurs or incident occurs just for 100 percent uh, a couple of years ago there was a death at an amazon uh, facility being built in edmonton and it barely got the attention that it deserved um and yeah that was that's the only time that people will come to job sites um you'll never have somebody in government that is inspecting apprenticeship ratios here you will never see um somebody disciplined because they pull permits for 12 different companies so you have to take safety into your own hands. Um, the best way that I can explain this is if somebody tells you to work live, that is absolutely not correct. You should be de-energizing the work whenever possible. The only work that you should have to do live is the necessary work of testing. You should be wearing your gloves. And by that, I mean rated gloves, uh, rubber insulated gloves with leather protectors. There's not really a 250 volt AC rated glove that's out there. So if you have to test live, wear the proper PPE. So, so in simplistic form to put it, if I want to rephrase what you're trying to say, is when you're working in the field of electric trade, it's assumed or it's given that you need to be aware you should be exposed to these things. It should be normal for you, right? Yeah. So people think that, okay, if you're and working out field, be prepared to get a shock. It's nothing big deal. What you're getting is not going to kill you or something. Or you shouldn't be surprised, you know? <laughs> if, you know, we set up these rules, we set up these guidelines, but if nobody's out there checking to make sure the young workers that don't know any better so, um, so, are staying educated. So there are like a three levels of breakdown I can see. One is a strong enforcement. Second thing is, 
companies looking for a cheaper labor by not employing the right grade of the skilled workers in place. And then third thing is, there's also this perception that the apprentices, if you bring to work, probably they will not question you. And <laughs> they probably don't know what to ask. <laughs> well, they're learning from you. And if right, you've absolutely. learned wrong too, yeah, yeah. you know, like I, I hate to say it. I used to tell my guy shock didn't do anything because I learned from somebody that told me that shock didn't do anything. And in 1960, in the electrician's handbook, um, it talks about using your fingers to test for voltages up to 250 volts, about testing signal circuits with your tongue. And that is the attitude that was taught to the people that taught me. And that's the attitude that we have to get rid of. I think that attitude still exists in some parts if it is not gone completely, I guess. So people still doing this two finger test, you know, to touch the live wire to make sure it's live wire. Dad, people still do people that. People are still doing it today. Yeah. That's... And the, the, th the thing is the reason why people are confused that there's not a lot of research into this injury is electricity wasn't invented a long time ago. Um, electricity was invented in North America. And the only two hospitals in the world that I'm aware of that research this injury actively are in North America. A lot of people look overseas to Europe for new knowledge and new technology because Europe had a larger population. It, it, you basically, we came from Europe over to here. But once we got here, we created electricity here and we haven't identified the issue yet. We're, you know, we're years ahead of Europe for how long we've had electricity. Um, and we are just starting to identify the research really from the two uh, places, uh, the Sunnybrook Hospital out of Toronto, um, as well as the Chicago Electrical uh, Trauma Research Institute out of Chicago, obviously. They both started their research in the mid nineties, uh, right around the time when arc flash was being relevant, but arc flash is flashy. Arc flash makes explosions, it makes fires, um, it's visual. What so, I have is not visual. I mean, I mean, it's interesting. It's funny and interesting, as you said, this art flash is flashy because maybe the interest is also, if you look at it, uh, the amount of PPE that goes into art flash is significantly high compared to the PPE that goes into the shock, right? So if you look as a vendor perspective- 100%. <laughs> you have a more opportunity- Well, as a vendor perspective, yeah, what are you gonna sell? Are you gonna sell a full suit or are you gonna sell a pair of gloves? Right. But from a vendor's perspective as well, um, in the last decade, um, I don't know when the United States adopted the arc fault uh, regulation. We've now adopted the arc fault regulation. And that was, a, that was a big stepping stone because that took the price of a breaker from about $7 up to closer to 40 or 50. But this is where we're at now is we've already sucked up that huge cost. What the manufacturers should be considering is well, those, now that the AFCIs are already in place, it's only like $7 more to do an AFCI, GFCI. And we should start looking at making sure that all AFCI protected receptacles are also GFCI protected. Um, because that protection, just like everything else, you know, electric cars were expensive when they came out. Well, they're getting cheaper now. And we really need to start realizing that shock is dangerous. So when did you actually realize that you, all this symptoms were a cause of electric shock that you have received over a period of some time. I mean, was there like any kind of a medical diagnosis that kind of put that exact perspective of, okay, you received this, this, the shocks, and as a result of that, you developed these symptoms. So when did you really get into that realization point where you realized that these are the causes of electric shocks that I took over years? Well, I had been searching for decades, as I had said, but in 2017, after I started losing the use of my limbs, not being able to walk and having severe chronic pain, and I was talking to Terry Becker, um, you know, you're familiar with Terry Becker, he made the introduction to us, he is the one that identified this is most likely the issue, this is probably what's causing your problems, John, he reached out to another industry friend, Mike Doherty, and uh, Mike Doherty responded with a lot of information. And as I read through that information, everything clicked. Um, the biggest article that really clicked with me was one published by my government, by WCB Alberta, or the insurance board for my province. It was titled, The Long-Term Sequelae of Electrical Injury. Um, so when I read that and I identified with 
95% of what it was saying, not all at once, but throughout my time, the nervous breakdowns, all of that, I filed my WCB claim. And that's when I decided that this has to be my injury. Nobody else can figure it out. So, so the point here is I'm trying to, the, the first shock you received was way back in 2006 and seven, five and six, right? Yeah. And then 2006, about then. 2006, and then we're talking 2017 was when you were able to connect these dots together. This is almost like a decade or It's a decade of, of yeah, that's what I would like to. It, it was a decade looking for answers. And then once I read that medical review, I reached out to the author of the review, Marnie Wesner, and I reached out to another person that was identified as the leader of research in our country. And that was a Dr. Jewel Fish. Um, he responded back to me. He said, you know what? This sounds like what you have. I've moved on to pediatrics. I can't officially diagnose you. Um, I talked to him. I pleaded with him to talk to my doctor. He did. And, you know, my doctor was convinced that this is what I had. But yet the system that wrote that medical review, they refused to acknowledge it. I mean, you kind of mentioned the the effects of the shock more so in the physical pain, right? So pain on your legs and having headaches and all this, right? So what other things that you have? Yeah, migraines. Migraines, okay. Can you just explain anything else? I mean, I know that there are like more to that, not just a pain in terms of, I mean, neurological, psychological, and physiological, all these three categories fit into the effects of shock, right? On the human body. So you kind of explained about more yeah. like physiological to start with. So, so how did that change from what you were doing to what you were doing today? I mean, were you able to go into other soft jobs or what, were you, what was your decision and what was your path forward from that point when you realized these things are not going to get you to do what you were used to do before? Well, as I said, in 2018, nobody knew what was happening. Okay. Um, so I went, I tried to go back to work with an electrical company and um, I was very fortunate to secure a position as like a no tools foreman. Um, and I found that I could still kind of drive around. I would have a very flexible schedule so I could go to the gym and do yoga and all the treatments and everything that I needed to do for this. And um, I couldn't do a full day worth of tool work. You know, I was tired. I have to have naps in my cars, et cetera. And that's when I realized I just didn't believe I could ever work the tools again. You know, um, I started looking into business development roles because of the flexible schedules, because of, you know, everything that business development would allow you to do. And then eventually I got a job selling diesel engines. And, you know, it was, if I had to say anything, it was the ideal workplace. It wasn't my ideal job. I loved what I did. My passion is building things, but I had an office the size of a garage. I asked for my sit stand desk to be put placed in my office. I brought it from home. I had an ergonomical chair and I could close the door. I could bring my yoga mat. I could stretch. You know, if I was on the phone calls, guys wouldn't know if I was standing up and stretching because I could wear these earbuds and just talk with them. But something that I found really strange with that job is when I started to notice the memory issues significantly. For me, I've always had known, you know, early in my career that, hey, your memory, you, you're not always going to remember things. So as long as you, you're quick and you can relearn them or you can find them, um, I use digital assistance. But this was different. Like I would take phone calls. I would do a $100,000 sale. And I would type in my notes immaculate into the CRM system that I used myself. And then I would go to my boss, boss's office to talk about the sale I just did. And he would ask me who the customer was. And I was like, I don't know. I got to check my notes. Well, who is the company? I don't know. What did you sell? I don't know. <laughs> um, but then you went back to my notes and there's the hundred thousand dollars deal. Like as I'm talking, I still know the questions to ask. I still know how to do that. But when I get into a fluent conversation, I'm not always have the attention span to remember what's being said sometimes. And that's that what was scary I mean, basically, you know, it was the fact that you just because of this shock effect, basically, right? So you'll be talking on something, and then you'll be at a standstill point where you can figure out where you are headed with the conversation or where you are going with the thought process at times. Remember the details of the conversation, or for example, a common thing for guys is they'll be driving, and they just will miss their turn, and they'll just keep going. 
You know, I've done that plenty of times, you know, you're driving and something distracts you. You're thinking of something in your head. It just goes blank and you're like, oh crap. And that happens, you know, that's a, that's a common thing that can happen with guys that experience this injury to a higher degree. Not everybody experiences the memory issues. More people experience the depression and the anxiety. And <clears throat> the biggest thing that I want to stress there is when I started raising awareness on this injury, I had a manager um, of uh, a lot of electricians over his life. He worked various companies and he had told me that he obviously felt all of these issues. He had a sauna, et cetera. But his biggest take back from my discussion was if management only knew, if we could only look for the signs before it was too late, because while we were managing all of these electricians, we had more suicides than we would like to admit. And that's where the mental health issue of this comes into effect is imagine pricking your finger one day, developing depression, anxiety, pain, memory issues another day, never being able to relate it to that finger prick. And then the rest of your life spirals downhill afterwards. And, and those are not like immediate or like a month later, it goes like 10 years, right? That from what I understand from you, just like the consequences. No, it, it's, it's the Wesner review says one to five plus years. Okay. For me, I can trace the effects back as early as a year to two years. The, the effects are delayed not always delayed. I've talked to guys that received a single shock uh, from a back bed transformer and they lost the use of the entire left side of their body. They couldn't talk. They couldn't see out of the left eye. They couldn't move their body. Um, and then there's guys like me that take lower voltage shocks and the effects can be delayed. Um, and I really believe it goes back to that electroporation where once a current passes through the cell, that cell membrane opens up and say a lower voltage shock doesn't have as much energy to do that instantaneous cell death. It still has enough current to cause the, the chronic pain, the arthritis and the mental health issues. Tell me about your worker compensation claims and benefits with Alberta, because you mentioned you could not connect the dots. Uh, I have Twofold question on that. So one is, is that primarily because not all the shocks were reported when you had these shocks or was there was no research or published information that's present to connect the dots that would justify or all the symptoms for which you are suffering today or the cause of those shocks? What was the reason? So early on, um, the issue of not having the recordings of the shocks was a problem. Before I got witness statements, before I had multiple people in writing saying that this was an issue that they experienced while working with me, um, then it became an issue of trying to get the workers' compensation system to acknowledge the publication that they did in 2013 and quite frankly, did not bring to industry's attention because in 2011, I was sitting on industry. In 2015 and 2016, I was the Edmonton chapter president of industry. Um, and we never heard a whiff of this. I was looking for those complaints. So once I got into the system and I was under medical investigation, it was now trying to just get enough supporting medical evidence on my end you're, it's a system that is supposed to help the workers, but as a worker, you have to do your due diligence. And the easiest way to do your due diligence is to start reporting your shocks. If you get a shock, you need to report it, record it, keep it in your family and tell your doctor. And the easiest way that I can suggest is get the person's email that you're supposed to report it to at your work, send them an email on your personal email and BCC your doctor at the same time, instantly. You know, if you are unfortunate enough to get shocked, that's what you should be doing. And before that happens, you should not be working on live electrical. You should be de-energizing, lock out, tag out, 
And when you have to work on live electrical equipment for testing, et cetera, you should be using a certified pair of rubber insulated gloves and leather protectors. They're not expensive. They should be in every toolbox. And if you're unfortunate enough to get that shock, you need to report it, record it, and keep it in your family. Because a year, two years, three years, when you start to realize that maybe all those aches and pains you're having is this, um, they might have not kept those records. Because your employer, there's two responsibilities. And this applies to most compensation systems. As a worker, I have to you know, do my job and work safe and do what I'm taught. And if I do get into an accident, I have a responsibility to report it to my employer and seek medical aid if I feel like I need it. My employer then has a responsibility to provide me medical aid if I ask for it and report it only if it results in the day, uh, a day after or more than the day of the accident um, of time loss. So most shocks, you don't take the day off the next day. You don't even take an hour off. You go back to work. So most times when you get a low voltage shock, um, that will never actually be recorded with WCB. They'll never even know about it. Your employer only has to keep it in their company records. And even with tax laws, you know, people don't keep records for seven, more than seven years with tax. Health and safety records, I'm sure, are you know, thrown away every few years. So that's why it's important that when you get a shock, you're reporting it and you're recording it. And the simplest way I, I can recommend is, as I said, send an email. BCC your doctor, tell your employer. BCC means your doc, your employer is never going to know that your doctor was told. Sure. I mean, that's really, I mean, great points, John. I mean, as I was trying to think through as you're speaking, one thing I noticed is basically the shocks get unreported. People take it very light and easy because they're not having any impact because they just get the prick and then they just walk away and they don't see anything until like, year or two years or five years until to get to the point where they really see the symptoms. And when they get to the symptoms, they don't have a proper documentation or anything to justify or connect the dots to make sure that these are the causes of the shock that they received. And that's kind of where you are currently battling with the worker compensation claims and trying to justify your situation. This isn't just an issue that I'm trying to fight for for myself. I am trying to get Alberta to acknowledge this industry because this injury because healthcare is provincial. Like it is in the United States, your healthcare is probably done through the states. It's done through the provinces here. So for me to go to um, Sunnybrook and get treated, it's a lot more difficult. It's very expensive and there's no one funding it. So I would have to fund it myself. Um, if I was a worker in Ontario, however, um, I could just go on Sunny Brooks website, print out a referral form, and as long as I take care of my transportation, my housing myself, I could go there. Okay. In Alberta, it's a lot more difficult. And then you throw three and a half thousand kilometers between there. And unless you have a place like workers' compensation that's either going to pay for you to fly there and live there for months, pay for you to your wages while you're getting treated, you're never gonna get help if you're not in that province. So something that's important is something that was suggested at the ECA keynote speech, and that is the establishment of a Canadian electrical injury network. And I would recommend the same be done in the United States, a United, uh, an American injury, uh, electrical injury network established, because there's only two hospitals, one in each country. So if we're going to help workers across our countries, we need to have other healthcare and hospitals and rehabilitation places as accessing and developing a network where workers can go locally and they can get diagnosed and treated and helped by the experts in Chicago, by the experts in Toronto. And then through that network, we're going to start developing more doctors that are experts at diagnosing this injury. We're going to start raising funding and be able to find a way to diagnose this injury. So there is a scan that can say, yep, you have electrical injury. Because right now, it's not the fact that this injury doesn't exist. It's the fact that the equipment that we're using to identify this injury is not good enough. 
Most in Alberta, I was told that I went for a level five MRI. I had a level five MRI done on my brain and my full spinal cord that showed nothing. And that's exactly what I was told it was going to show. And the lack of evidence is the evidence until we get MRIs or machines that can identify this issue. Uh, Sunnybrook just got a level seven MRI. I've heard of level 11 MRIs, but those are million, multi-million dollar machines. Um, and until we get enough electrical workers that can go into those machines and figure out if they can find out if this injury is shown on those machines, right now it's about establishing trusted professionals that know how to properly diagnose this injury. And, and a Canadian electrical injury network, an American electrical injury network is going to be the best chance we have at helping electricians across our countries. From your experiences, what you'd like to have our uh, fellow electricians to take away from this key message. So if you want to tell the three key takeaways from this entire discussion, what you want them to be aware of and how you want them to address those in the real time scenarios. The key takeaways that I want to provide you work de-energized. Turn the breaker off, lock out, tag out. If you have to work energized, do it for testing purposes only to verify things are working or to do your troubleshooting and wear your rubber insulated gloves with leather protectors. Um, shocks are dangerous. And the other message that I really want to push forward is report, record, and maintain a record you need to maintain that record. Just like you are supposed to hold on to that blue book, like in your wallet, your journeyman card is supposed to be with you all the time. In your filing cabinet, there should be a folder that has a record of all of the shocks you received. And it needs to have, you know, in an email, it's easy to say, hey, I sent it to my work and, you know, here's the proof of an email. But if they fill out a document for you and you have to fill out a workplace in incident investigation, get a copy of that yourself, put it in a filing cabinet because a month later, three months later, a year later, you might need those. They might be essential for you getting help because the scary thing about this injury is for me, I spent a thousand dollars a month on treatments. That's a thousand dollars out of my income that nobody is providing me. And unless you can show records of this or you have a good strong argument or a lot of witnesses on your case, you're gonna have a hell of a time getting help. So based on experience, John, what do you think is the importance of electrical safety program? I think you talked about, you and I talked about the importance of electrical safety programs at the facilities or at the construction sites or at the contract organizations. So what do you think as a significance of electrical safety programs? I think it's huge. I think we should be teaching electrical safety first before we teach guys how to climb up ladders and work on electrical equipment. Um, I'm very thankful for the work that our CSA Z642 and Z643 yeah, and the Z463 committees are doing because for the first time in history across Canada, you have to have an electrical safety program now. It's mandatory from my understanding and that is a huge significance um, as well. Um, I'm, from my understanding, we're looking at adding electrical safety into the Alberta apprenticeship curriculum now, which is also a huge uh, accomplishment. So how do you think that um, electrical workplace safety, how do you think that will change how the things are today by adding the safety program from your point of view? In industrial, it's gonna kind of get a little bit better. Industrial is extremely safety. In commercial, it'll probably be adopted and taken care, you know, taken seriously, especially because commercial jobs usually have a lot of commercial general contractors that care. I think it's gonna be a struggle in residential. Um, I think the general contractors and residentials really don't care um, about it. And the electrical, some of the electrical companies um, especially the guys that are not indenturing their apprentices um, that have don't maintain journeyman uh, apprenticeship ratios. I think it's going to stay the same for them. And that's where, why I'm very excited. As I said, that I think we're introducing this into the Alberta um, apprenticeship curriculum because it needs to be taught in school. Hmm. This needs to be taught from the employer. Obviously they, you know, the hardest part is when you when you're apprenticed, 
you usually don't go to school until a year after in the trade. And these habits are developed um, right away before you enter school. So yeah, it needs to be developed um, with the employer. I think residential is going to be the hardest market. And that's where I think that the enforcement, the government, um, safety codes council, that's where we need um, a lot of the enforcement focused on is the residential uh, market right away is we need to have safety codes officers going to job sites and making sure that electrical safety programs are being followed, that guys are educated and, you know, go in there, be the friendly police officer, say hi, you know, talk to them, be like, Hey, did you know that this happens? You don't have to crack down on them, but we need to have um, safety codes officers visiting, visiting our construction sites more. John, by the way, uh, we don't, we want to emphasize that uh, Grace also offers electrical safety program, a licensed electrical safety program that Terry Becker has developed and we uh, licensed it, licensed it from Grace. And if you guys are interested to, learn more about it, please uh, fill out the survey question that will be posted after the, as you take the exit survey and be more than happy to uh, get in touch with you and discuss that in big detail. Thank you uh, so much, John, for uh, sharing your valuable insights and experiences on your journey, uh, getting this long-term consequences of electric shock. Uh, thank you everyone again for watching this presentation. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us or reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to connect you with the right people. Thank you again for your time. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Banu Srila. I'm the Director of Technical Marketing here at Grace Technologies. Today, I'm super excited to announce the launch of our new Grace Expert Network program. What is Grace Expert Network? Grace Expert Network is the new consulting services wing of Grace Technologies. Through this network, we partner with industry-renowned consultants and subject matter experts to provide the customers the best-in-class expertise in the fields of electrical safety, maintenance, and reliability. Well, my name is Terry Becker. I'm an electrical engineer, a certified electrical safety compliance professional and an IEEE senior member. I've been providing independent electrical safety consulting to all industry sectors, uh, mostly in Canada and some clients in the US, uh, related to the application of the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Standard or the NFPA 70E Standard for Electrical Safety in the Workplace. Um, I've been an electrical engineer for 29 years and um, 13 years ago while working for a large employer, I became aware of the arc flash and shock hazards uh, and realized that uh, the company I was working for had nothing, zero hazard identification, no arc flash or shock PP, and this was all new in Canada back then as well. So this set me off on a, I guess, a career changing and a life changing uh, mission uh, once I became aware of the arc flash hazard and equally aware that the shock hazard had been neglected. I've since then, in 2007, devoted my career and uh, my life really to trying to get it right with these two hazards. And um, getting it right is um, implementing, in my opinion, starting by implementing compliant electrical safety programs. The consulting services are primarily aimed to support our mission at Grace Technologies here, which is making maintenance safer, smarter, and more productive. With over two decades of experience in serving our global industrial customers in electrical safety and through numerous interactions, we found there is a huge gap between the policies, procedures, and practices implemented by our clients. But through those conversations, we found a common theme when it comes to the implementation of safety and maintenance management systems or programs practices, policies, and procedures, and related management systems all exist for one common reason, which is compliance. Though compliance is the outcome of the implementation of these measures, users often fail to connect the dots to the actual problem they solve, or why they exist in first place. Without a strong sense of why, it makes it highly difficult and impossible to implement these systems consistently in the long run. So what I've also realized that there's a significant culture behavior shift here that we need to continue 
to influence um, with not only qualified electrical workers but non-electrical workers and uh, specific to the shock hazard for sure more awareness more attention um, dealing with the shock hazard and then of course separately the the shock hazard just again dealing with with the history of of qualified electrical workers working energized with the grace expert network our team of consultants will ensure you document your practices policies and procedures in a management system or a program and exactly to your unique business requirements not more than what you need or not less than what is required we assure you that we can evaluate your current management system or program if you have one and work with you in identifying the gaps or developing a new management system or program if you don't have one so the goal here is to bring credible, defendable compliance solutions that, that again, that will ultimately deliver a safer workplace and increase productivity with respect to ensuring we can still have energized electrical work completed, but we have those work tasks when authorized uh, managed to uh, a risk level that's as low as reasonably practical. So again, look forward to working with you and uh, appreciate you uh, listening to this great intro and again, just expressing my thanks to the Grace Technologies team and look forward to uh, helping uh, industry um, either get electrical safety programs in place or update or replace existing programs that uh, will be compliant and defendable to OSHA regulations. Again, look forward to uh, working with you.